in the second year of the Peloponnesian War, one of the world's greatest world wars in 430 BCE, an outbreak of the plague erupted in Athens. In 2020, the world is, and did, experience its own plague of sorts. The purpose of this is to document the severity of one of history's worst plagues in hopes it provides a valuable perspective of a forgotten history for those of us today. The following is a recount from Thucydides' The History of the Peloponnesian War. Thucydides recounts the following. The disease certainly did set in immediately after the invasion of the Peloponnesians, and did not spread into Peloponnesus in any degree worth speaking of. While Athens felt its ravages most severely, and next to Athens the place where were most populous, such was the history of the plague. Many who were in perfect health, all in a moment, and without any apparent reason, were seized with violent heats in the heat and with redness and inflammation of the eyes. Internally, the throat and the tongue were quickly sufficed with blood, and the breath became unnatural and fetid. There, following sneezing and hoarseness, in a short time, the disorder, accompanied by a violent cough, reached the chest, then fastening lower down, it would move the stomach and bring on all the vomits of bile to which physicians have ever given names, and they were very distressing. An ineffectual retching produced violent convulsions, attacked most of the sufferers, some as soon as the previous symptoms had abated, others not long afterwards. The body externally was not so very hot to touch, not yet pale. It was of a livid colour, inclining to red, and breaking out in pustules and ulcers. But the internal fever was intense. The sufferers could not bear to have on them even the finest linen garment. They instead insisted on being naked, and there was nothing which they longed for more eagerly than to throw themselves into cold water. And many of those who had not one to look after them actually plunged into the cysteines, for they were tormented by unceasing thirst, which was not in the least assuaged whether they drank little or much. They could not sleep, a restlessness which was intolerable never left them. While the disease was at its height, the body, instead of wasting away, held out amid these sufferings in a marvellous manner. And either they died on the seventh or ninth day, not of weakness, for their strength was not exhausted, but of internal fever, which was the end of most. Or, if they survived, then the disease descended into the bowels and then produced violent ulceration, severe diarrhea at the same time set in and at later stage caused exhaustion, which finally, with few exceptions, carried them off. For the disorder which had originally settled in the heed passed gradually through the whole body, and if a person got over the worst, would often seize the extremities and leave its mark, attacking the privy parts and the fingers and the toes, and some escaped with the loss of these, some with the loss of their eyes. Some again had no sooner recovered than they were seized with forgetfulness of all things, and knew neither themselves nor their friends. The point of beginning this with that description is not to necessarily say, well, it could have been worse. That's a very easy thing to say. It's a very almost reductionist thing to say. It's very convenient. Instead, it could have been different. It could have been very different. Had we or you been born then instead of now. It is not a competition of pain or suffering, but just to give a description and perspective on what many before us had to suffer with, and perhaps many in the future will look back on on today with an equal perspective. Perhaps. We will continue. The general character of the malady no words can describe, and the fury with which it fastened upon each sufferer was too much for human nature to endure. There was one circumstance in particular which distinguished it from ordinary diseases. The birds and animals which fed on human flesh, although so many bodies were lying unburied, either never came near them or died if they touched them. 
This was proved by a remarkable disappearance of the birds of prey, which were not seen to be either about the bodies or anywhere else. While in the case of the dogs, the result was even more obvious. Because they live with man, some of the sufferers died from want of care, others equally who were receiving the greatest attention. No single remedy could be deemed as a specific, for that which did good to one did harm to another. No constitution was of itself strong enough to resist or weak enough to escape the attacks. The disease carried off all alike and defied every mode of treatment. Most appalling was the despondency which seized upon anyone who felt himself sickening. For he instantly abandoned his mind to despair, and instead of holding out, absolutely threw away his chance of life. Appalling too was the rapidity with which men caught the infection, dying like sheep if they attended one another. And this was the principal cause of mortality, quite similar to the transmission of spread to today's affliction. That when people attend like sheep, they die like sheep. When they were afraid to visit one another, the sufferers died in their solitude, so that many houses were empty because there had been no one left to take care of the sick. Or if they ventured, they perished, especially those who aspired to heroism. For they went to see their friends without thought of themselves and were ashamed to leave them at a time when their very relations of dying were at last growing weary and ceased even to make lamentations, overwhelmed by the vastness of calamity. But whatever instances there may have been of such devotion, more often the sick and the dying were tended by the pitying care of those who had recovered, because they knew the course of the disease and were there themselves free from apprehension. For no one was ever attacked a second time, or not with a fatal result. All men congratulated them, and they themselves, in excess of their joy at moment, had an innocent fancy that they could not die of any other sickness. They had grown almost an arrogance, thinking perhaps that they were impregnable. They were shielded. They had been spared by a god, perhaps. And they were more invincible than the next man or woman. I guess that is the arrogance of man. To conclude, the dead lay as they had died, one upon another, while others hardly alive wallowed in the streets and crawled about every fountain craving for water. The temples in which they lodged were full of corpses of those who died in them, for the violence of calamity was such that men, not knowing where to turn, grew reckless of all human and divine. The customs which had hitherto been observed at funerals were universally violated, and they buried their dead each one as best he could. Quite coincidental to which we buried our dead across the world when we feel overwhelmed with death. Whether we've seen countries do this across the world, making makeshift burial grounds and just putting people in convenient holes where is most efficient and effective to put them. Or perhaps you were perhaps you saw the origin the origins of this affliction that we are going through this year and saw that some people are like to this history during the Peloponnesian War, they also died in the streets. This has occurred during this time. However, most do not have to confront this reality. The large majority of us do not have to confront the visceral, very physical reality of death in front of us, like our ancestors did. And if you're not faced with the reality in front of you and all you get is a news article or a secondary source from another, well, it's no wonder our likelihood and our 
ability to take it seriously or confront it with seriousness is fractured, is, is affected. It's no wonder conspiracy theories pop up when you are not, when you don't have to confront a lodge full of corpses. Or men and women dying upon each other. We are, we are shielded in many ways through the spectacular protection and stability of our modern society. We will continue. Many having no proper appliances because the deaths in their household had been so numerous already lost all shame in burial of the dead. When one man had raised a funeral pile, others would come and throwing on their dead first, set fire to it. Or when some other corpses was already burning, before they could be stopped, would throw their own dead upon it and depart. There were other and worse forms of lawlessness which the plague introduced at Athens. Men who had hitherto concealed what they took pleasure in now grew bolder, foreseeing the sudden change how the rich died in a moment, and those who had nothing immediately inherited their property, they reflected that life and riches were alike transitory, and they resolved to enjoy themselves while they could, and to think only of pleasure. Who would be willing to sacrifice himself to the law of honour when he knew not whether he would ever live to be held in honour? The pleasure of the moment and any sort of thing which conducted to it took the place both of honour and of expediency. And so, it seemed like in the face of an unknown threat, a viral threat of death and mortality, caused us humans, caused the human mind, a can cure cause the human mind to strip back any psychological attachment to the superficial, to the riches, to acquirement of things. And even a recognition that this is all transitory, this is all temporary and ends up getting transferred from one person to the next a wealth transfer a ownership transfer and so we don't know when the next when our day could end i could be dead tomorrow next week and so they resolve to enjoy themselves and so death mortality severely when we're faced with it when we're confronted with it offers a perspective like no other. It offers a grounding of life, of priorities, of priority, of what is important individually to you. And suddenly, sacrificing yourself and putting honor above everything was no longer a priority. The pleasure of the moment and any sort of thing which conduced to it took the place both of honor and expediency. No fear of gods or law of man deterred a criminal. Now that's important to note. No fear of gods or law of man deterred a criminal. Those who saw all perishings alike thought that the worship or neglect of the gods made no difference. For offenses against human law, no punishment was to be feared. No one would live long enough to be called to account. Already a far heavier sentence had been passed and was hanging over a man's head. That was death. That was imminent mortality. That was imminent suffering, pain, and death. I'll reread that last little sentence. Already a far heavier sentence had been passed and was hanging over a man's head. Before that fell, why should he not take a little pleasure? This implies that human behavior becomes lawless and chaotic in the midst of a loss of control over... Or, or at least facing the reality that we have, a, we have very little control. 
over the extreme randomness and chaos of life and facing and confronting of one's mortality. And so what can we learn? Well, there's many things. There's many perspectives that we can take from this, not story, but history. To conclude the last portion of what we were saying, and it, it's interesting to note how psychologically our value system can shift dramatically in the face of chaos, in the face of instability. The face of instability, the face of mortality, can make a man and woman just lose all fear of punishment. Because what is worse punishment than death? Death of you and death of those you love and care for. What is worse than the pain and suffering that precedes death, including death? Well, hmm, that's one of the worst things to, that man fears. And so no wonder everything else will fall below it. There was a, there was a restructuring of values and, and, and the hierarchy of what was important changed and shifted dramatically for years during this plague. And this is important to note because any time where an individual or group of individuals, a community, a city, a state, a country go through a time like this, the individual plague itself is not the only threat. It's man who is the, also the threat. The unpredictability of man. The lawlessness of man. The criminality potential of man. The violent potential of man when they have nothing more to lose. We see this happen in war. We see this happen anytime someone is faced with their mortality and threatened with their mortality severely. You know, we walk around today and we don't have to confront the reality of mortality on a daily basis until someone around us gets sick or dies. Only then are we thrust into the whirlwind, the tornado, the cave of who am I, what am I doing? I could die any day. Even then, it's a fleeting moment because it it's like an intense fire, but then the t fire dwindles. And maybe, maybe if, if you're if you're if you have the mental framework and capacity, you keep that kindling alive to know that, or memento mori, it could be you any day. Remember that you can die and you will die. Maybe you can keep that kindling alive, and that can help ground you and give you a perspective and a fever and, and an assertiveness about life that that you didn't have before that can serve you and so that concludes the plague in Athens during the second year of the Peloponnesian War I hope this recounts by Thucydides can provide a unique perspective that we are not alone, we are not the worst to have it, and we are not the best to have it, necessarily. That there have been others before us, our ancestors, who have suffered greatly, and that perhaps we can look to history to teach us about how to deal with today. <laughs>